Thank you so much, Ms. Sorrow. What a wonderful way to start us off. Okay, so good afternoon, late afternoon, everyone. Welcome so much uh, here today. Um, we're so ha happy to share space with all of you. Um, and I'd like to start off our session today by um, saying that I'm so grateful that we're gathering here today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. And for those of you joining us here in Zoom and on other lands, uh, please feel very welcome to use the chat feature if you wish um, to share an acknowledgement of uh, the lands that you're joining us from and or take a moment to just reflect on where you are in this moment. Um, I'd like to add that something that I've been doing in the last year or so when I have the opportunity to offer a land acknowledgement um, is to actually just take a moment and share a text that I've read recently by an Indigenous academic or artist or activist. Um, and so as many of us in the Faculty of Education here at, uh, at UBC know, we recently had uh, a session where we got to learn from the amazing Joe Crona. Um, and so I wanted to take a moment just to share this text. Actually, maybe I'll just hold it for us. Um, it's a really beautiful book that I just finished about two weeks ago, and it's about Indigenous pedagogies, reconciliation, and anti-racist uh, education. And the reason I wanted to share this one in particular is because there was something that she wrote in this book that really sort of resonated with me with respect to thinking ahead to this event today. Um, there's a moment where she actually writes, learning requires taking thoughtful risks. And I couldn't help but think about how this truth really connects with um, so nicely with, how, with some of the research that's going to be shared in today's session and how, for example, um, play can be understood as an act of thoughtful risk. And so I think about, for example, Dr. Shelby Beam's work and how she's going to be talking to us today about how um, play can actually be a strategy for pushing back against the ways in which young learners can be underestimated in some learning contexts. And so I just thought that was a nice little link to today's link session um, and a way to sort of bring some Indigenous uh, brilliance into our session today. And so with that, um, I'd like to introduce that this is the first event that Dr. Melanie Wong and myself, my name is Amber Moore, have dreamed up for what we're calling the link series. And so uh, if you don't already know, link stands for literacies and libraries investigating new knowledges. And we have created this initiative to produce dedicated space to connect literacy research to K-12 classrooms and school libraries with the aim to promote whole school approaches to literacy learning. And this work really emerged from a shared commitment to provide additional learning opportunities for students enrolled in our two online LLED programs that we coordinate. So the first is the LLED online literacy MED program, as well as our teacher librarianship programs. And so if anybody is joining us today from outside of these programs, we'd really like to encourage you to get in touch with us if you have any interest in these programs um, or to get on our LLED website for more information. So thank you. So our first event is dedicated to the theme of play. And I, I love this playfulness piece of it. Um, and we're really looking forward to the presentations that will occur today. Um, and we're gathered with both panels in person and online. So what we've done is we've really sort of tried to connect you um, both physical and in virtual spaces. Um, but as we're so excited to learn together about the ways in which we can create space for playful literacies to emerge in diverse K-12 learning contexts, we are especially thrilled today that our LLED department head, Dr. Christina Kantelainen, has generously offered and agreed um, to do some opening words for us to kick off our event. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and evening, everybody. I couldn't be more happier than I am today and being here with this very, very important topic as part of our, our future series. Thank you so much for organizing this event. I am very passionate in trying to understand and research and promote play not only in the lives of children, but in all our lives. Play has intrigued many researchers in different disciplines, not only in education, but in psychology, in sociology, in anthropology, and so forth. And the more we research about play, the more curious and the less we know about it. It really is an area that we want to understand more. And for this reason, this 
today's event is very, very important. What we know about play today, and when we think about particularly young children, we know that children play for the sake of play. They don't play in order to learn. Learning kind of happens at the background. So what happens when we connect play with education or playfulness in education and learning? Is something lost? Are we purposefully trying to take something out from children's cultures and try to integrate into learning and education? That is actually fairly serious, isn't it? Usually educational programs are serious. They are pretty important after all. We are serious too, but I think we think that introducing an element of playfulness into theories of learning and pedagogies could perhaps contribute to something new. Are we able to give children more agency, more voice, when we aim to create educational opportunities where we really give children the choice and direction of their own learning activities? What are actually the design principles of playful learning and education? What does it mean? Play is also risky, it's dangerous, it's play is also about power. There are also these dark sides of play that we need to be aware of. And at the same time, since we, I think every one of us wants to respect children's cultures and voices and something that play is theirs. So what do we take out? How do we integrate that into education that has its own particular goals? What does education look like that claims to be playful? I think all these questions are very important for us to address. We don't know, and we have so many different interpretations of playful learning, for example. What does it really mean? What do playful literacies, what do they mean? And how they emerge in children's lives and young people's lives. We must not forget teachers, professors either. I believe that playfulness in education and in engaging in learning requires that the educators, teachers and professors are also playful. It's a relational phenomena. It doesn't always show out. Playfulness can also happen when we play with ideas on our mind. Play can also be invisible. Play can be visible too. There is so much already knowledge about different tools that can be used or should be used uh, for to support play and at the same time learning. But sometimes we forget this, I believe, that we also need to think as educators, teachers, how we can join play, how we can join play with the students, with young children or older ones, so that we don't destroy something valuable. Play is very important in the country where I originally come from, Finland. The whole early childhood curriculum and early years in the elementary school are very much play-based. That's a hard job, although we would think just leaving children to play together is something that we need to and want to cultivate. What's the role of the educator? What's the role of the teacher? How do we integrate purposeful educational goals? Many goals, developmental learning goals, can be achieved by just letting children play. And we adults, educators, can just make sure that children are safe. But sometimes 
are we enough playful that we want to join children's play? And do children allow us to join their play? There are more questions than answers, and I'm sure today we are beginning the journey. Playfulness is very important to our department, and I want to emphasize it's for all, and we all need to think, all need to think the opportunities, tensions and risks, integrating play and playfulness with learning and education. Let's begin the journey, but let's not be this the only event. Let's continue and perhaps, perhaps develop something that we can also communicate to wilder words, worlds. Thank you for being here, our online audience. I hope you will have a playful spirit online and here in person, what is going to happen today. Thank you and thank you so much for hosting this event. Let's be playful and take risks. I would like to say thank you so much for Christina for her warmest and also thought-provoking um, opening remark that not only opens up this space, but also opens up the infinite journey that we are embarking on. So that was a fantastic one. Um, yeah, I would like to offer a very quick outline of our, according to one and more ambitious agenda today. Um, so first of all, I'm going to introduce our presenter panel, and then we are going to um, have all our researchers each offer a um, 10 minute presentation on their play scholarship. And then Amber will introduce the uh, respondent panel. And then they will each have time to offer their ideas and impressions of the research we just learned about before engaging in a conversation together. Finally, we will open up the conversation up to our wider audience and end here closing remarks. And then if you're participating on Zoom, you can just type the question in the chat, whether um, that's publicly, or you can maybe DM or private message me so that I can take notes and ask them later in the Q&A session. So. Now, um, I'd like to introduce our presenter panel. So first one is, you wanna say that here? <laughs> Dr. Melanie Wan is an assistant professor of teaching at the University of British Columbia. Yeah, yes, please take. <laughs> She's passionate about moving research into practice. Her research interests include K-12 students, ELL, there's a camera here, <laughs> and technology enhanced classrooms. Melanie has extensive experience teaching in the K-12 context. Most recently, she was assistant, assistant ELL strategist. strategist, thank you. For the Calgary Board of Education, she's the cohort advisor for the online Masters of Education in Literacy Education program. Thank you, Melanie. And then the next speaker is Harini. Do you have a, your camera on, or would you like to come here? <laughs> it's always good to see the face and you know, level of the speaker. So, <laughs> Harini Rajagopal is an assistant professor in the language and literacy education at UBC. You're not shy about taking bottles. <laughs> um, Rudy, in anti racist perspective, her work focuses on relationally collaborating with children and teachers to welcome their multimodal and multilingual communicative repertoires into uh, mainstream elementary classrooms while playing, paying attention to the intersectional in inequalities and inequities. Yeah. Thank you. And Dr. Shelby Bean, I think. No, spotlighted. Yeah, is an assistant assistant professor of English education at Illinois State University. So joining over Zoom. Prior to this um role, she has taught high school English in Florida. Her scholarship attends to the democratic possibilities of secondary English classrooms, including how literacy play how literacy play serves as a site for literacy development and critiques of dehumanizing teaching and learning spaces. So thank you so much for joining us today. And Dr. Kevin Wong, we are just trying to find him and spotlight. <laughs> Melanie is doing it. Yeah, I'll just continue the introduction. He's an assistant professor of education at Pepperdine University in Los Angeles, California, USA. 
He's a former elementary school teacher from Hong Kong and current teacher educator, equipping teachers for today's multilingual, multicultural, and multilacial classrooms. Thank you so much for joining us today. And last but not least, um, Dr. Ava Becker. Thanks, Melanie. Is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Alberta. In her current project, she's exploring the use of visual and oral models in researching people's lived experience with language, with particular attention to memory, emotion, embodiment, and language ideology. Thank you for joining us, and welcome, and welcome back <laughs> to the LLM community. Now, I would like to hand it over to Amber. All right, and with that, we're going to get started learning from our amazing uh, researchers and hearing uh, what they have to say about play. And so with that, let's get going. Hi, amazing graduate students, teacher librarianship um, students as well, and also colleagues and all of our other guests too as well to this virtual environment. I am very excited to share a little bit about my research, but you gotta give me a second so that I can share my screen. So hopefully everyone in Zoom can see what I am seeing right now. Um, but I'm gonna share my findings from my recent ethnographic case study of a grade four online classroom, playfulness in the gaps, verbal play in a technology enhanced classroom. So my research story today, I'm gonna briefly talk a little bit about learning spaces and technology enhanced classrooms, introducing Ada Lovelace School, which is where this study took place. Um, a critical part of the study was the role of the teacher. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Miss Hawk's role. And then I'm going to share one illustrative example from this year long ethnographic case study in a grade four online classroom. And finally, I will talk a little bit briefly about um, the implications of this study for a K to 12 classroom context. So in order to really better understand the learning experiences within a technology enhanced classroom, I have conceptualized a technology enhanced classroom as having many different learning spaces. Now, due to the affordances of digital technologies, this is very much possible. In my previous research and my ongoing research in these environments, I've noted that school sanctioned learning spaces are those spaces where school based activities, so like worksheets, um, PowerPoints, the institutional activities that we always see in a classroom context may occur. Um, but then interstitial learning spaces are those spaces where traditionally non-sanctioned activities might occur. So often the really fun stuff. Um, so the back of the hallway, the back of the classroom, at home, in your home environment, in your bedroom. So within these, any physical space, there's a potential for many different learning spaces. So what is significant, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic and in this post-pandemic times, is how emergency remote learning and online learning spaces, such as an online school, bring forth this ongoing tension. What we're seeing in these reconfigured, traditionally interstitial learning spaces, like your bedroom, um, they're being morphed and reconfigured, rather, into these school-sanctioned learning spaces. And what happens is there's this very interesting tension that occurs, right? However, this is also going within and happening within a face-to-face -face environment where students are reconfiguring learning spaces to push back against what they would traditionally do in an institutional learning space. And it's within these spaces that playfulness or verbal play might occur. Okay, so briefly, I wanna introduce you to my uh, research site, which is Ada Lovelace School. The study took place from October 2022 to, yes, June 2023, so this is a very recent study. Um, this grade four class is located in a fully online grade four K to 12, rather, school, Ada Lovelace School. It's located in Western Canada, and the research participants featured in this brief illustrative example are three multilingual learners. So Money Puck, Pink Glitter 68, and King K, and yes, those are pseudonyms that they self-selected. So during the conversation with Ms. Hawk, the classroom teacher, we discussed how she built community in her classroom. She highlighted several significant ways that she socialized her students into engaging in playfulness. First, community is built off script. You have to be in the moment with the kids. Those are the precious moments. I'd like to ride the waves. Sometimes you're a bit silly, like we're studying eyes right now. And I was a bit goofy. So I said, everybody zoom in and put your eye really close to the camera. And I'm kind of goofy like that but kids love that stuff. Stuff like that is like living in the moment. 
So therefore, living in the moment was something that Ms. Hawk encouraged in her grade four classroom. In fact, she encouraged this learning space that could potentially be playful when living in that moment. So I don't have a lot of time today to expand a little bit more, but I do think it's really important that I note to all of you here that Ada Lovely School was engaging in digital citizenship conversations. And as part of their plan, they really wanted to improve interaction in a breakout room. So as a result, these debate tasks were designed to sort of create those opportunities. Now, Ms. Hawk, the classroom teacher, provided very clear expectations, which you can see on the slide, um, sorry, in Zoom as well, on the screen. Um, and she also had practice runs with them. So just recognizing that they've had lots of experience with this. So I am gonna introduce you to this oil sands debate. And yes, I look so excited in that photo that you see here screen captured. I <laughs> promise it's way more exciting than what my face looked like. Um, but let's have a listen to the kids because I think it's so important to hear their voices. No, you're the host. Um, I'm doing pros and you're doing cons. Yay, finally, I get to be a host. I'm never a host. Anyways, welcome to round three, everybody, in the debate sport on the sports channel. Dun -dun -dun -dun. Anyways, anyways, first we've got on the left corner and in the right. So, start with your opinion sentence. My opinion is that oil sands in Alberta should continue. Now, Kim, what is your defense opinion sentence? Um, okay, yes. Oil sands development should continue. Now, give your oh, reason. Wait, 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 wait. You're in the pose, too. You have to go to slide six, not four. Oh, yeah. Oh. I, I, I got confused, too. I thought you were like... Slide six, okay. Now, re-give your defense opinion sentence. Okay, slide six. Oil sands development should not continue. So in this short clip from the live debate, Pink, six, six, Pink Glitter 68 clearly indicates each person's role. So what we see here is that each student had a clearly defined role and identity. And the next turn, if this interaction lines three to seven, Mani Puck picks on this host identity role. And however, perhaps what's really interesting for me as a researcher is this notion of Goffman's footing. Um, and this is the alignment towards his co-participants. So Pink Glitter 60 and King K in this debate exchange, um, this choice of footing is one of a sports channel host in relations to his co-participants. He's providing play-by-play -play commentary of his debate between Pink Glitter 68 and King K. He manipulates sounds da -na -na -na, and engages in language play. He also sets the stage, Pink Glitter 68, to the left. Now, the remaining part of this debate excerpt is where King K has actually taken the wrong side of the debate, and you see Pink Glitter 68 redirecting her friend. So let's listen to later on in the debate because there's just so much fun. That was a that was a point that punched me right in the stomach. Next, and now give your first reason that it could block that attack and redirect it. Oil sands make more greenhouses gas greenhouse gas than oil drilling. It is it's the dirtiest of all. Oh, that hit me right in the head. That was a good block and redirect. Now, give your second reason and to contact and stuff. Uh, and, and I will tell you later when I come up with the stuff. Um, my second reason of why oil sands development should continue is that they return the nature when they when they just try to do uh, a mine. And an example is if they cut down a tree to a mine, they would then have to plant trees in a different location. Okay, you're next. Give your reason. Okay. Communities close to the oil sands have more cancers. Okay, these were good smashing hits with your boxing gloves. Now give your final opinion sentence to conclude this uh, smashing fight of Jamaica. What's your opinion sentence? Later in the oil sands debate, Money Puck continues to engage his audience in his sports channel commentary host. 
So in lines one to three, he uses phrases such as punch me right in the stomach and blot that attack and redirect it. He takes on the identity of a sports channel host using common phrases that might be heard on sports television during a sports event commentary. So for example, block that attack and redirect it is common hockey lingo um, if you watch hockey. And Money Puck was playing with the language to engage his audience, manipulating the sound or language features such as phrases and using common phrases in sports commentary in a school sanctioned activity. He was engaging in verbal play. So in this particular turn, Money Puck is also taking his communicative repertoires from his interstitial learning spaces, so like watching TV and what he's learned from that, and bringing it into a school sanctioned space so that he could complete this oil sands debate. So later in the next exchange, again, Money Puck is engaging in this sports channel commentary phrase, and then we interrupt him in the chat. So you heard that little ding there. And Pink Glitter 68 asks him, where do you think of this stuff, Money Puck? And then I say, it sounds like hockey talk. Now, the reason why I made that assumption was because Money Puck and I have had many conversations about him cheering for the local hockey team. So I know that he's a huge hockey fan. So again, what we see here is this sort of ongoing discussion and ongoing verbal play that's happening there. And then later on down the line, you'll see that Money Puck again comes back with words such as smashing and sports channel commentary phrases that are very common to what he's used to. So after their bait, Pink Glitter 68 revisited that question she asked in the chat. And Money Puck comes up with, like, where did he come up with this stuff? And we learned something very much about where he comes up with this for role play. Okay, the answer to all your questions is the NHL hockey, Italian soccer, a bit of punch out talk from the video game Punch Out, and then lots of other sports mixed in with that, even racing cars is in it. So what we hear is, is that his inspiration for verbal play comes from a variety of different interstitial activities. So I've had ongoing conversations with Ms. Hawk about where these ideas for polygamous occur, right? There were dancing memes in the classroom. I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> there are memes, there are dancing seals and so forth constantly going on in this classroom. So that was just one instance of playfulness. But in one conversation after our exchange about this oil sands debate, she gave me a little bit more insight into why this occurred in the classroom context. She said, I used the examples of the Price is Right and Jeopardy to explain what a host is as like a game show host. And there are like two kids that knew what was ha ha ha. So like, it's like, think of the TV show that has game show hosts. You guys tell me. So one can come up was fake or cake. And so the kids were talking about naming different game shows that have a host. These people have to be engaging and they have to keep the conversation going. So what I learned here is that they were explicitly told that they had to be engaging and keep the conversation going. So briefly, my implications for K to 12, teachers play an important role in socializing their students to engage in playfulness. That means creating an environment that models playfulness, inviting opportunities for this to occur. Verbal play is one way that students engage in play in the classroom context. These opportunities help school sanctioned activities to be more engaging. Thank you so much. Karini's up next, so I'm just gonna set up. Thank you, thank you, Melanie. Hi, everyone. Vanakam, namaste. I'm delighted to be here um, with you all in the room and you folks online. Um, my name is Harini Yasupal. I'm going to really, in this quick little um, time that we have, um, um, talk to this idea of playfulness and, and, and playful subversion. But first, I want to start with gratitude for um, being able to do this talk and be here with all of you on unceded Muskian territory, uh, and also to thank um, this beautiful panel for supporting us and um, you folks for organizing us and getting us together. Um, as I start, I want to say that all the photos um, that I'll share in this presentation are um, either taken by kids, the children in my study, or um, taken off children's work. Um, and so I offer them here as one way to bring in children's voices and children's stories and children's perspectives, um, and recognizing that uh, literacies are made in multiple ways. Um, a little bit of context. 
So my um, the research that I'm going to be talking to uh, today is from a grade two, three classroom where I collaborated with the teachers and um, the children in the classroom, but particularly focused on the um, those who were categorized as ELLs. So there were eight children, emergent bilinguals. And my work really was to collaborate and design together with the group ways to design pedagogies that valued the range of communicative repertoires that they had. So languages, multiple ways of knowing, photography, drawing, these were the ones that they, the children reached for. And really, my um, hope was to disrupt normative understandings of language that exist within classroom spaces and resist also normative practices that are often um, quite prevalent within classrooms. And also really fundamentally to recognize racial linguistic ideologies as being so powerful within classroom spaces and, and these ideologies being very deeply rooted um, and uh, often directed in deficit ways towards children from multilingual communities um, whose stories of, of capacity are often rarely heard um, within these spaces. And I'm also going to um, offer us, because as Christina said, there's so many ways in which we come to understanding of what play is, what playfulness is, uh, from different disciplines, from different fields, but also just different understandings from different researchers. Um, and so for today, what I'm offering is really reaching for Walwind um, and thinking about how children reflect, replay, and record their stories and their lives through play. And also really that, that last sentence, to connect with others around meaningful texts. And that's how I'm, I'm thinking about play as a literacy, as a way of self-making, and really foundationally as a relational resource. Um, I want to, I really am playing with this idea of thinking about play as um, with the metaphor of a kaleidoscope. I'm thinking about how children through play can manipulate and, and create new and unconventional patterns to um, include others, perhaps, or to understand systems, or to um, create emotionally rewarding experiences for themselves. Um, and particularly with that in mind for today, um, I'm thinking about play as a multiliterate tactic that was used by the children who I worked with. So these racialized and marginalized learners within this classroom space to um, re reframe and remake the space, the social space of the classroom, when they were often constrained by the physical and material place of the classroom, the very monolingual, very normative classroom space. And um, in particular for today's talk, I'm thinking about language play, where their playfulness becomes a tactic to manipulate the here and now reality of their classroom space. Um, and using that tactic as a way to bring in alternate worlds, different worldviews, um, and create new worlds for themselves within there. So I'm going to offer us, time permitting, really quickly three stories. Um, the first one is um, this one. So two Tagalog speakers were in line to be for lunch recess. And one of them, Jordan, who is one of the children who uh, was one I was focusing on, an emergent bilingual, started humming the song, Bahay Kubo, about a home in a small hut and the foods that grow near it. And so it appears that this was a childhood song that he, his mother had taught him and he was uh, remembering it. And Luke was standing right next to him, also knew the song. He was also a Tagalog speaker. Um, and, and when they heard each other singing it, they became animated, they had this joyous moment of connection and started singing it, and then they, the, they started shaking their arms and their bodies and the whole animation, animated singing within the line. And what happened was that that drew lots of other children and me, who was on the other side of the classroom, to that space. Um, and they began explaining the song line by line. And um, Jordan, who was the, the first child, was particularly proud of his Filipino identity, very, very um, engaged with his family back home in the Philippines and here as well. And so for him, this was a great moment of connection, both with his language, but with his community and his way of being as well. Um, and he, this was the first time that he was connected with Luke. Even though they were both Tagalog speakers, they didn't, they weren't really in the same so social circles. 
Um, but this impromptu singing offered them um, a space to connect with their common cultural history, their familial identity, and reframe how they thought of each other. However, um, as they were seeing this in that line, one child said, you should only speak English in school. Jordan's face fell. Luke sort of like shyly moved back and went back into the line. And um, Jordan, when I asked him about this later, wasn't quite keen to talk about this. But um, what I interpret as the dominant voice of English only ideology that, that spoke that line really um, contained him. And what playfulness did before that was offered a space that enabled the classroom, all the kids and me, to value their familial and familiar, familiar cultural resources as literacy and as a relational resource. That's my story one. This is my second story. Um, this is from a child, Anne, also seven years old. Um, and the class was working in small groups about the Canada Food Guide. And so they were making lists. And Anne was in the very much in the periphery of his group. And um, figuring out, he, he was a um, Vietnamese child, Vietnamese refugee background. Uh, he, and he spoke amazing Vietnamese, dry, and English and supported his mom with banking, supported his mom with uh, insurance and picked up the phone always. And so he was the, the broker in the house in terms of linguistic and cultural brokering. Uh, but at school, he was very much on the margins of lots of uh, normative literacy practices as he was with this activity as well. Um, and then a little while later, I walked by their group and here they were drawing this. I don't know if you know who this is, but this is a YouTuber and a DJ and a musician whose name is Marshmallow. So they started out talking about desserts related to the Canada Food Guide and, and presumably all types of donuts and, and fun things. And then from there, this was the way Anne connected with the group. So this was his relational resourcing of his playfulness, of his communicative repertoire. So in his family, he had unrestricted access to YouTube. He was always on YouTube for learning all sorts of exciting things, including lots of ninja drawings and dance moves and, and Fortnite game play. And um, of course, he knew a lot about um, Marshmallow, the DJ. What he did was, and I quote this, he made this boring lesson fun by um, bringing in this playful character, but also this playful world within the, the boring world of the Canada Food Guide. Um, and I argue that he subverted the normative um, monolingual classroom space by bringing in this example from a completely alternative world um, that, that he had a lot of access to, but others in the class didn't. And playfulness in this case offered a relief from the social and very material constraints in that classroom space for Ahn by imagining a new reality beyond what was typically resourced within that classroom. I'm seeing time and I'm gonna jump through this one really fast. Um, I'm not gonna play the audio, but what I will do is say really quickly that Jay is the protagonist in the story and he called this the name game when he heard the recording of this later. So what he did was he um, enjoyed sharing lots of stories and they were drawing on the floor. This was like uh, three blocks and they were drawing on the floor and just having a good time. And then he asked me, so how would you say your name in Spanish? And then he, he asked everybody in that space. And what he did was hearing, speaking and living with four languages. So he was speaking in Spanish, he was bringing the prosody and the intonation and the minute differences in accents and in Punjabi and in English and in Hindi. So he, he sort of played with the metalinguistic awareness and accents and prosodies of four different languages within a tiny little um, story, story episode. And I know that issues of accent and accents and how people enunciate 
pronounced uh, and pronounced pain point to really sociopolitical sort of understandings and implications of what is normative, what is standard, what's, what's regularized within classroom spaces. And so I offer here that what Jay did was using a playful game to allow a reversal of what was normalized within that classroom. Um, particularly because Caden, one of the one of the children here was one who would always help him with his writing. Um, and so um, in this case, Jay became the expert and Caden was the one who, who needed to sort of be led along in, in with this game. Um, I'm going to jump through this really fast, but I'm, I'm offering that playfulness as a multiliterate tactic for these three instances um, offered a way to be a cultural resource, um, to offer a way to imagine new realities, and also um, to upturn power relations. I'm going to end with this. Um, how might ideas like this, um, the ideas of playful talk that we saw just now, and um, that act in a, in a sense as bridges between what children's lived realities are and their linguistic realities in other places, or their material or their um, digital realities in other places, um, how, how might those get activated along with song and movement and orality? How can we support the, the creation of these alternative worlds towards building culturally sustaining practices? And um, I want to end with how can, what can we learn from children's playful subversion? What can we learn when long held conventions, long held ideologies are upturned and in ways that children know how to do in agentive and navigational ways? And how can we as teachers and librarians and educators work with these um, stories? Thank you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. okay. I am looking for my share button, which here it is. Okay. Okay, can you all let me know if you can see slides? It's perfect. Good to go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I am so excited to be here. I am Shelby Beam. I'm um, zooming in from Illinois State University, where I'm assistant professor in English education. Um, I'm really excited to be here for this conversation and have really um, enjoyed the speakers so far. I am going to take us from elementary to high school students. Um, and before um, I start talking about um, the high school students, I want to just talk a little bit about how I'm entering literacy play in my work. Um, for me, play is an attitude or a stance. Um, since I'm in teacher education, I also think about it um, kind of like as a disposition towards teaching. It's really a, a tool for being um, in the classroom, both for teachers and students. Um, and within that, I think about how um, as a tool for being, we're thinking about prioritizing kind of those unscripted moments in the classroom, which can be playful. Um, I also think about play as a form of critique to norms. So I think really um, similar to what Harini was just speaking about, thinking about how when students might play in school spaces, this is kind of a refusal of inhumane realities um, that we often see in an education system that is often dehumanizing. Um, so within those two framings of play, um, um, for my work, it's also super important to think about how um, the social context shape what's possible for entering literacy play um, and, and for entering play in general. Um, I really like Erin Trammell's work, um, who brings attention to the idea that play is really connected to power um, and how um, if playfulness is ignored, um, if power is ignored within playfulness, that um, there's all kinds of implications for the work that um, ignore that play can manifest in really um, dark and harmful ways, in addition to joyful and imaginative and creative ways. Um, so again, I'm thinking a lot about how 
play itself can be a literacy, a, a tool for communicating and making meaning, but thinking really clearly too about how the social context shape what's possible in that regard. Um, so today, in, in the time that I have, I'm going to talk about one high schooler in Florida who I worked with named Juan. Um, he was in 10th grade in Florida at um, a, a suburban high school that was actually shifting um, towards um, some different coursework offerings as an equity initiative at the school. Um, so during the time of the study that I worked with Juan, um, the, the school that he attended had um, opted to have all students take advanced or like honors level coursework for their English language arts class. And um, that was actually the first time Juan had been allowed access to um, an advanced or honors type class up until that point he was in um what would often be thought of as kind of like remedial coursework and something super important about him is that he's very extroverted and sociable um and that quote from him on the right i just love i think it really conveys his personality he said like he loves talking um if he's not allowed to talk it just keeps building up and building up like water um and then it'll just start running out he'll bubble up with um emotions and um he said you'll be like where did all this come from um so as I mentioned, he in 10th grade was enrolled in this advanced placement English class. Um, and that was the first time in his high school career that he had been given an opportunity to be in advanced coursework. But actually he was um, considered an advanced student when he was an elementary schooler. He was in, um, in Florida, what was deemed kind of a gifted program enrollment. Um, but he was actually removed from gifted courses because um, he was labeled as unsuccessful because of his highly social needs. Nature. Um, and some of I've included some of his kind of reflection about this experience. He said that he couldn't be in that type of system because he talked too much is what his teacher told him. Um, later on, he reflected that that was messed up, he said, um, and he I really appreciate his reflection kind of in this last um, quote where he's talking about how he was realizing that he was scoring really highly on the standardized testing and um you know the the school that he transferred to was kind of asking like well why wouldn't you be allowed and gifted um and he had to kind of um make peace with the fact that he wasn't allowed in the system because of this key part of his identity um so then fast forwarding to now a 10th grader, um, the teacher who was teaching the, the English class that he was enrolled in, um, took up playful practices as a way to um, invite literacy into her classroom. So again, thinking about um, play in this space was a tool for Juan's being. Um, he was supported in imagining, he was supported in making unscripted moments that um, counted as literacy in a way that he had not previously experienced experienced in school up until this point. And this was such a shift for him. He actually, um, when I started working at the school um, with these students, I remember early on, I was in the office and he had been in and out for a disciplinary issue. And he was definitely identified in the school as what um, we would think of as kind of like a troublemaker, right? And so this um, playful invitation by the teacher really made him feel successful in the space um, in really important ways. He said that the English class was more comfortable than others. He felt like he could be himself. Um, and he noted that it's, it's like a reward instead of um, teachers saying like, hey, be quiet. Um, he also described the, uh, the space that it's like a controlled freedom. You have as much freedom as you could get in a controlled environment. It's amazing. You feel like you could talk. You're in English class. You're not sitting over here like, oh, I can't wait to leave. You'd be like, oh, I'm in here. Let's see how much work I could get done. And as a former high school teacher, his reflections were so just, uh, just it was emotional for me to see that he was entering this space in a way that felt like he could be his whole self, right? Um, and the literacy invitations that he took up um, really um, specifically like personal storytelling for him was a, a key way that I could tell he was um, 
finding belonging in this space. He also, um, you know, played with different topics and genres in the English class. And again, in a way that the teacher was facilitating this kind of more playful approach to literacy that really valued unscripted moments and um, kind of valued what Wants con contributions were to the classroom in a way that he previously had had not experienced. So for him, um, I really find um, play and this framing um, what this teacher offered in this classroom to be a way to push back against some of the deficit perspectives of Juan's story, right? He previously was marked as a student who was a troublemaker. He was removed from higher level courses and through the framing of play in the classroom, he was able to um, find comfort in the space. He also reflected on that he felt like um, his English teacher cared about him and um, was invested in his future. Um, and he also enjoyed the social learning opportunities that he had um, through the playful invitations that his, his teacher invited him to. So for me as a teacher educator, this is really exciting um, to think about play as a space for critique, as a play for as a place for um, you know refusal and resistance of um, the dehumanizing education system that I think um, you know we find students in, but also as teachers that we can make um, shifts to push back against systems that are harmful. Um, but as a researcher, I also wondered, well, what are the boundaries of playful being perhaps? And what are consequences um, that happen when refusal um, is surfacing through play? Um, I um, worked with Juan for the entire school year. And towards the end of that school year, um, Juan was actually um, expelled and incarcerated for involvement in defiance at school. Um, and this situation, he was painted as a violent student, as a 15 year old. Um, and as a, as a researcher, that was really hard for me um, because I had observed him finding success in this classroom. Um, but reflecting on his story, it, for me, it seemed that rigid expectations of who successful students are had once again limited his potential at school. Um, I wondered a lot about how these conditions that were made possible in this classroom um, supported one but then he left that space and had again those kind of like social contexts that limit possibilities for play um, on on the day that he had his um, event that caused the the expelling we were sitting together in his class he had received a perfect score on an assessment given earlier the week he was super excited and proud of that work um and even later on i was looking at some of his work and ironically he had written about nonviolence during the school year um he had written quote when you want to solve a desperate problem do you solve it with violence or nonviolence if you choose violence you should keep reading so i can change your mind so that again signals to me some really powerful um tensions about the work of play that i feel so um i feel so passionate about but also um the limitations of what we also have to address as teachers and framing the work beyond classroom spaces, right? Um, so what I'm left with thinking about based on Juan's story, um, which didn't necessarily have a happy ending, but it was the reality, right? Is that um, when we problematize this idea of kind of troublemakers and perhaps think about play as critique and resistance, we also have to think about how play is perceived within the broader social context um, that might limit possibilities for play. And I do think that as educators, we can name and shift those social contexts in really powerful ways. I think that literacy play and, and playfulness more broadly can be um, a way to have conversations about the relational and humanistic aspects of teaching um, and that we have to be really strategic about the invitations that we offer students, especially um, through the K-12 spectrum, that um, 
you know, they're aware of thinking about play and its relation to power. Um, and again, I'll offer um, Aaron Trammell's words as kind of my ending um, to my session. He says, play is political and approaches to this topic further the dynamics of white supremacy when they are need, naive to the implications that play is a form of power. All right, thank you. Everyone is clapping for you, Shelby. I realize you were muted. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is it all right if I go next? Or I, mean, I know I'm going next. Yes, is it all right if I go? <laughs> good to see you, Kevin. <laughs> good to see you too. And thank you, Shelby. That was so just powerful and um, really, yeah, insightful. And I'm you know, grateful to go after and as we kind of think a little bit more about humanizing pedagogy um, and as it might relate to play and multilingualism. As you can see from the title of my talk, it's uh, Play as Resistance to Rehumanize Multilingual Classrooms. Um, so yeah, my name's Kevin Wong. I'm an assistant professor at Pepperdine University um, here in Los Angeles, California. And yeah, very grateful to share space with all of you and to, um, yeah, I hope that this is uh, helpful for us as we just engage in this conversation. So I thought I'd begin by talking a bit about the context that I'm in. So thinking of multilingual learners in the United States, otherwise other, otherwise known as English learners, English language learners, emergent bilinguals, here I'm using multilingual learners. Um, they comprise about 5 million students in the United States, 10% of which are in our public school system. And of the population, 33% are in secondary schools. Um, the most common language spoken is Spanish, although very well represented of all languages um, around the world. Um, and, and I think importantly is that in the US context, um, the goal of education is often to assimilate these students into mainstream, quote, mainstream English classes um, so that they'd be able to speak and use English, the English language, but often at the expense of their heritage language. And so perhaps relatedly, this has got me thinking about uh, Paulo Freire's idea or notion of humanization, um, where he says that um, it, he describes humanization as the struggle to be seen as fully human, overcoming situations when individuals are, quote, reduced to things or commodities within an institution or system. And in this case, that institution or system is the education system. Um, and individuals are reduced to things when we think about the types of assessments that we're offering or who is disciplined as you know, we just saw as well from Shelby or heard from Shelby's presentation. Um, so human, to, thinking of dehumanizing multilingual learners in this US context, um, a really wonderful book, I have it here actually, if you'd be interested, is says that humanizing pedagogy is rare in US schools, which generally foster white monolingual English, middle-class epistemological and ontological norms and emphasize assimilation and achievement through high stakes testing, um, narrow curricula and punitive discipline. Um, schooling can be especially dehumanizing for students who have linguistic and cultural ways of participating in school practices that differ from those of their majoritized peers and teachers. So really not taking into consideration the different norms, different understandings, roles of what the school is, what the teacher is, what the library is, what, you know, the, the how school relates to society. Um, and rather than schools being sites for sustaining these life ways of diverse communities, these life ways are actually being erased and eradicated, or as uh, Valenzuela says, ignored and obliterated. Um, I choose this image because I really love the roots that we can see, you know, stemming from each of the students as they are, um, as, it, as these roots define who they are through generations of historically accumulated and culturally developed bodies of knowledge. Um, and it just thinking of them being erased and eradicated, just one cut, you know, kind of um, uh, takes them away from that lifeline, that life way of the diverse communities that they belong to. And so I'm um, calling for a, a focus on the human, employing pedagogies that sustain the cultural lifeway communities, in other words, the culturally sustaining pedagogies, which I'm sure many of us are aware of, um, and honoring the historically accumulated and culturally developed bodies of knowledge and skills that are essential to these communities. I use the iceberg, which I know many of us are very familiar with, we're on the top, but those are some of the cultural practices or 
ways of being, knowing, and doing that are more obvious. But as we know, these are historically accumulated ways that our students are, uh, our K-12 students are coming to classrooms and so many ways that we don't, so many things we don't see and are not aware of. And so bringing this conversation to the idea of play, I think of play as resistance against, against a system that is not designed for multilingual learners against a system that dehumanizes multilingual learners. Um, thinking of play as resistance, whether that's pedagogical resistance, so choosing to do something pedagogically in spite of the system, relational resistance, which you know I can see the connections to what Christina and Harini were talking about with relational phenomena, um, or humanize, uh, choosing to humanize. Um, teachers have opportunities to make humanizing choices within the system, strategically playing as an actor in the system to resist and change classroom learning spaces. So I'll be talking, I'll be showing examples where I'm thinking of humanizing choices that teachers um, and educators might be using um, in K-12 systems. But thinking of um, just a little bit more about play is, you know, the student and the context that they might come in. So on the left is, is Broff and Brenner's ecological systems model and thinking of the child in the middle, but there are these concentric circles of, um, of, of classrooms, families, societies, values that are influencing the way that the student, the child um, operates within a system. Um, and then on the very right side, you know, the things I had been talking about, culturally sustaining pedagogies, humanization and whatnot. And it's at play in the middle here that we see the teacher having this position, this agency, this um, power um, to serve as an actor uh, to resist the system and change classroom spaces. Um, so with that, thinking of um, the, the teacher as an actor, I'm focusing on Ms. Mendoza, um, an ALD teacher, uh, academic language development class. So this was a class um, that taught um, students who were aged 12 to 17 years old. It was a class so, uh, that they would go to half male, half female, speakers of Spanish majority, but still Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, Hindi, and Russian represented. Um, and the students were at the emerging or expanding levels of English proficiency. So just really at the beginning as they're um, developing their English language. Ms. Mendoza herself is bilingual Spanish English, um, a child of Mexican immigrants, a veteran of teaching with many years experience, and also importantly tapped as an expert teacher by the district to serve um, as a teacher trainer for bilingual students. Um, and so that's how I got connected with her. And this was in 2022 when we were in the midst of online and then face-to-face uh, -face and then online and then face-to-face -face teaching. So it was a flip-flop, a very dehumanizing perhaps um, way of thinking of teaching. Um, so through interviews with her, thinking about the ways that she might have stood against the system, the agency that she had as an actor, um, I have four findings that I'm going to briefly cover with just a quote each and a question for all of us to ponder or consider, uh, depending on the role that you might play. Um, so thinking of play as resistance to oppressive and dehumani dehumanizing structures in English language education. Um, one is thinking of teachers, uh, the, the affected, affective moves that teachers could make in a climate of efficiency. You know, we can all relate to this idea of efficiency and curriculum. Um, teachers establishing connection in a system that isolates, like physically isolates, as well as labels English language development students or ALD students. Um, another one, thinking back to agency, is the agency that students could have in a system of prescribed and often unrelatable curriculum. And then finally, vulnerability from the teacher herself in a tradition of, of, of authority, as we think of what teachers are, how people often perceive teachers to be. So first, affective moves in a climate of efficiency. Here, uh, Ms. Mendoza said, um, just in the ways that she would teach, I told them that we would start with the focus on pair share, and we all use being pair share, right? Um, which to me is not just speaking to one another, but listening with our ears and most importantly, with our hearts. Um, so this is something that came up over and over again as she talked about listening with our hearts and took time to talk to students about what that even means. So really pausing to listen uh, instead of just finding the right answer. Like, what is it that a student is trying to say? Um, you are important no matter who you are, no matter whether you have documents or no documents. So that's talking about legal status um, in the United States. You are important. You are an important human being. So again, just pa and these are things that she would say to students. So a pause to really affirm 
their identity and who they are in a system of efficiency. And I did mention that the yellow, the orange that I've highlighted are kind of moments where I see play happening, play being the, the teachers being an actor that's standing against a system of efficiency in this context. And so for us, whether we're teachers, librarians, researchers, um, humans, you know, I think we, uh, one thing that I'm, that I'm learning from Ms. Mendoza is, you know, how I meet, how might we use pause to meaningfully connect with our students, to really hear them from their hearts, as well as um, knowing, th letting them know that they matter. So it might be in the questions that we ask in research, it might be in the initiatives that we roll out, it might be in the curriculum that we're pacing through. Um, what does that look like? The second one um, is from a reading buddy program. So Ms. Mendoza actually took her students to a first grade classroom at another school um, where they were like linked with a first grader and they had to read an English book to them. Um, at first, the students, first students were terrified. And well, at first they didn't take her seriously because they didn't think they would actually go outside um, to another school. But as you can see from the quotes here, and I'll just read the orange part. She said, I think they didn't believe me because they were very nonchalant about the whole thing. Once I started giving them their permission slips and giving them information about when the bus would arrive to pick us up to take us to the elementary school, then they got fired up with reading. So here, a purpose for connection um, of students who are often isolated in another classroom, you get taken out and put somewhere else um, and don't follow the same curriculum as others. And the students started asking, and I'm gonna read the bolded font. What if kids laugh at my badly pronounced English? What if they correct me? What if I don't, what if I don't go? Um, and she said, I reminded them that at that age, kids tend to listen with their hearts. So again, that, that reinforcement of the hearts. And needless to say, my students walked out of that elementary school as superheroes. So um, it was a positive, successful experience as she made that, that intentional decision to take time out to connect these students with other humans, with other people who would benefit from, from them, from their being, from all they have to offer. So it's question two, who are your students and how can you connect them to the school and broader community in ways that are synergistic, that are um, humanizing, that are life-giving? Um, third, going back to this idea of agency in a system of prescribed and often unrelatable curriculum, thinking back to the quote about white supremacy as well as the hegemonic um, um, norms of curriculum and design. Um, here, when considering the next unit of study with her students, Ms. Mendoza stated, I asked the students what they wanted to learn about, and they mentioned so much I was overwhelmed. I wasn't going to be able to cover all those topics, so that's when I got the idea of having each student select an issue that was close to their heart. Actually, now that I'm reading them aloud, I'm noticing the heart motif, like she really, um, I told them to think about what mattered to them the most. Students chose topics that were engaging and relevant to their lives, topics uh, where they were excited to become the expert. And how kind of radical is it to let students who are deemed not able to speak English and need just repetition and drilling to be experts in things um, outside of English, though using English and uh, probably the heritage language as a medium. These topics included the role of immigration and immigrants in society, the discovery of the Americas, electric cars, plastic pollution, pollution, COVID-19 vaccine, gender roles, discrimination, and animal rights. Um, so just really powerful of, of what happens when we choose play, when we choose to stand against um, a system and, uh, and give the agency back to the students to learn what they are interested in. Um, yeah, what matters to your students? Um, and how can your students feel like they matter as well? So I think that is a really powerful question that can really drive the ways that we're designing lessons, implementing assessments, um, humanizing the environments of um, feedback and uh, assessments and also questions we might be asking in research. And lastly, um, vulnerability from the teacher in a tradition that of authority where teachers are often seen as authoritative. When Ms. Mendoza first shifted to online teaching, she asked herself, how will I get students to listen to me? And I asked the same question when I was teaching online. I'm sure maybe some of you were. How can I continue to help them develop English reading, writing, speaking, and listening? Sharing her humanity with students, she said, I told them how hard it was for me and that I needed their help as I delivered lessons. Sure enough, every lesson I taught, I would ask what they thought and if they felt they had learned and if they felt they had learned. A scary question to, to, to pose to your students um, and true vulnerability, but um, it, I think it just kind of, you see the power of, of what happens when you bring your humanity to a shared space um, and trust your students with that. 
And so my last question is how can you bring your humanity in the unique roles that you play in this K-12 system um, to the shared space and what might that you know, bring? Um, so yeah, just kind of to summarize, these are those four questions. How might you use pause to meaningfully collect, connect with your students? Who are your students and how can you connect them to the school and broader community? What matters to your students and how can your students feel like they matter? And lastly, how can you bring your humanity to the shared space? And a final thought is, you know, as I mean, it's obvious we are teaching humans, but we are first teachers of humans, truly, uh, and second teachers of language. So, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Kevin. Oops. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you, but I can still see the white thing on the side, Ava. So you know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Everyone else made it look so seamless. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone for hanging in to the end. Um, a lot of wonderful presentations to follow here. Uh, so my name is Ava Becker and um, yeah, uh, it's my pleasure to be back in the department where the research that I'm gonna share with you today um, began. So um, my goal with this presentation is to shed some light on the ways, it's a little bit different from, from the ways play has been conceptualized so far. Um, to shed some light on the ways that children play with language to mitigate experiences of vulnerability and interaction in order to stay with the emotionally challenging yet personally meaningful topics they're sometimes called upon to talk about at school and I'll talk a bit about more about that shortly. Um, the interaction I'm going to share with you comes from my dissertation research, which was a multi-sided year-long ethnographic case study that I conducted with one Chilean Canadian family in a Western Canadian city. My focus here is going to be on a stretch of talk uh, from a group interview that I conducted with Ella, a nine-year-old girl, and uh, three of her classmates during recess in their Spanish-English bilingual school. Like much of our work, um, this study was born out of this disjuncture that I noticed between what I was reading and what I knew about the experiences of specifically heritage, so HL, heritage language learners around me. Um, as King and Ganusa observed almost 20 years ago now, the most important issues at play in heritage language maintenance may not be linguistic, but instead concern politicized social and cultural interactions. In learning Spanish as a second language in classes alongside heritage learners, uh, I found this to be true. Many of the heritage, uh, Spanish heritage learners that I knew had come to Canada in the 70s and 80s as babies or young children, their families fleeing conflict in countries like Chile and El Salvador. For them, the specter of their families' difficult migration loomed large in their day-to-day -day lives. But because their migrations had been well documented, talking about their migratory past did not put them at risk of deportation. In fact, for some, like the family in my study, it was a source of pride as it was indexical of all that they had overcome and the social justice work that they were still involved in. But regardless of parents' embrace or avoidance of the painful migration stories that they may have, such stories are not uncommon in language learning contexts, and all learning contexts are technically language learning contexts. Um, and of course, with the number of displaced people in the world forecast to rise over the coming decades, the question of how to engage with children's difficult migration stories will only become more relevant in classrooms and specifically those um, with a culturally sustaining pedagogy or mindset. As applied linguists have noticed in recent years, the increasing destabilization of social, political, economic, and ecological systems during this stage of the Anthropocene will only continue to unearth the fault lines of both our shared and inequitably experienced vulnerabilities. 
So what happens when shared public experiences of vulnerability like exile manifest generations later as a kind of narrative vulnerability? Under what conditions do our origin stories become tellable and hearable at school? Throughout this study, I noticed how um, the Kalfu family's migration story, which was an exile story, was told with both pride and reluctance, depending on the teller and their perception of its hearability in a given interaction. In the interview excerpt we're going to look at, vulnerability and mitigation strategies and playfulness work together synergistically to foster a space of relationality and connectedness through times of interactional discomfort. One way of thinking about talk is in terms of talk within a serious frame or talk within a play frame. In Jennifer Coates' work on this, she found that play frames and mitigation strategies work together. For her, play frames are collaborative, low stakes, creative, and unpredictable, in addition to having the capacity to diffuse tension and facilitate exploration of difficult or taboo topics. One of the features that makes them particularly playful is the unpredictability of their deployment. So you can't know beforehand what's going to prompt a shift in frame. Vulnerability has been defined variously, but if we understand it as feelings of susceptibility and openness to attack, then we can begin to see clear links to mitigation strategies, which are defined as um, different ways in which speakers are on their guard, blurring their utterances, toning them down, and making them somehow revocable. As such, they are adaptable and adaptive interactional resources that speakers use to create social and emotional distance. There's no like exhaustive typology of the discursive resources that can constitute a play frame. Um, but these are some of the resources the girls in this group interview use. So laughter and sing song voice, whiny voice, pauses, and lots of epistemic stance taking. <clears throat> um, so the excerpt that I'm going to analyze um, started about 10 minutes into our 18 minute interview. I began with a series of interview questions, um, starting with, do you know why you're in a Spanish bilingual school? Because sometimes children are, you know, their parents just put them in Spanish and they don't know why. So I thought we would start there. And with that question, we the conversation kind of evolved to, you know, their responses of stories of their family language maintenance, um, which in turn prompted further discussion and questions about their origins. Um, and let's see, maybe, yeah, let's listen before, before we analyze. So um, let's see if this works. Do you know why your grandparents came? Um, because there was like some stuff going on in Chile, mm -hmm. so they came back, came here because they heard that this was like the best place to come. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. No, I think it was my great grandparents that oh, were in wow. Because I think my grandma was born in somewhere I don't know. Around here, yeah. Do you know why they came? No. No. <laughs> That's okay. So do you know what was happening in Chile? Why your grandparents came? some bad people that were like had like bombs and mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. because they don't think they like the president mm -hmm. so they came here right before oh, so okay, okay. Mm -hmm. just so you know this thing is recording I know <laughs> why did you think to remind her just now uh could she started singing Oh, well, that's a perfect place to sing into the microphone, right? Okay, and then uh, two more quick questions. Okay, um, oh man, because I don't want to take up your recess, but... It's okay. So I start this segment um, in what might be read as a serious frame. Ella, do you know why your grandparents came? To which she replies with a heavily hedged response, um, which tones down her claims about why her grandparents came, making them, in Claudia Caffey's words, somehow revocable. She's kind of softening what she said so that I can't um, kind of attack it. 
And then Maya steps into the play frame, deploying epistemic downgrades and laughter and claims to not knowing, which playfully displays a form of epistemic distancing from my original question to the whole group, while at the same time staying with the topic. Then in line 29, um, I returned to my question to Ella about her grandparents' origins, shifting us back into the overarching serious frame of the exchange. In her next turn, Ella produces a drawn out, um, a lengthy pause, which serves again to hold the floor without contributing content, which might make her susceptible to attack. But then, somewhat remarkably, in lines 32 and 33, Callie assumes the role of interviewer and follows up on my question to Ella, demonstrating her investment in Ella's response, and at the same time, suggesting the hearability of Ella's difficult origin story. So in response, Ella leverages a playful sing-song voice, perhaps as a bid to re-enter the lower stakes arena of the play frame. In fact, uh, this short excerpt is filled with mitigation strategies like Ella's sing-song voice and hedges like some and like um, and claims to not knowing, all of which achieve a sense of distance while staying with. It's worth noting that it gets a bit awkward. I don't know if you noticed that too in the when I played the track. So at this point, I think most people would be inclined to change the subject. Um, and Ella could also have chosen to exit the interview at this time, citing recess as an obvious reason to go, but she chose not to. And in choosing to stay, things got progressively more interesting. After I positively assessed Ella's claim that her grandparents left because they didn't like the president, Zeta reappeared, um, bringing Ella's attention to the recorder. This simple observation placed within the serious frame prompted a seriously playful denouement in what followed. So, you know, this thing is recording. I know, Ella replies in a whiny kind of baby voice. And then Zeta aligns with her friend in an affiliative paralinguistic kind of moan utterance. Zeta's unexpected question prompted me to shift back into a serious frame. In my next turn, I ask Ella Zeta why she thought to remind Ella of the recorder at that particular moment in time, to which she replied, because she started singing. This response triggered a reaction token from me. Oh, and a chorus of laughter from the girls and a positive jovial evaluation from me followed by more laughter and sing-song voice and continued laughter or giggling. As Norik and Spritz have observed, laughter can be read as marking the end of conflict. So one way to interpret the pervasiveness of laughter and joviality here in this play frame um, is kind of as an acknowledgement uh, that we've come through this vulnerable space together, but also that the vulnerable space was bearable because they had the agency to playfully shape their contributions without prompting a shift away from the topic. And it turns out that the topic was one that Ella, at least, seemed to value, um, which was something I noticed in other um, contexts in this research. And we can see this, especially in the last three lines of this transcript. In, in the last three lines, I attempt to shift us back to the more serious frame by offering to quickly move through the final two questions and free up time for the girls to enjoy their recess. But then Ella replies, it's okay, suggesting her assent to stay in this complicated yet playful interactional space. So in this brief analysis of a group interview that I conducted with four nine-year-old girls, we saw that children can remain fully committed to the uncertainties of unfolding talk through the construction of a play frame. Um, uncertainties which might entice or delight, but also unsettle. In this sense, the play frame can serve as a sort of discursive refuge for talking about difficult origin stories in this case a playful non-committal space which is built with and alongside others for the exploration of something meaningful but also in some ways fraught. The play frames we built together also seem to foster bonds of solidarity between interactants since those who collaborate in playful talk quote necessarily display how finely tuned they are to each other. Um, that's from the Jennifer Coates study that I cited earlier. And importantly in this Maybe most importantly, in this brief stretch of talk, difficult aspects of Ella's story were positioned as hearable by me, 
but again, even more importantly, by her friends who wanted to connect with her through her family's migration story. So it seems that a sense of vulnerability in storytelling, whether something is tellable to a particular audience, can come from not knowing how your story will be heard. When vulnerability manifests in interaction, it can prompt topic shifts, but I would like to conclude today by inviting us to reflect on these two questions. Who do shifts away from challenging topics serve, uh, especially in regards to our students who may have difficult stories, family stories that we are unsure of how to um, elicit, solicit or, or navigate in the classroom? And what might the benefits be of facilitating a sense of maybe playful staying with narrative vulnerability? And that's all, thank you. Thank you so much to our wonderful researchers who offered us so much richness today. My head and heart feels very full and I'm so excited to hear what our wonderful respondent panel has to say in response to the learning that's taken place tonight. Um, so before we get to um, the ideas and impressions that have come up for, from our respondents, I of course have to introduce the wonderful folks we have with us here today. Um, and so I'd like to begin with first Jennifer Wilson, who's here on your screen. Uh, so Jennifer has been a teacher in Alberta with the Calgary Board of Education for 15 years, during which time she taught students in divisions one, two, and three. Her roles have varied from classroom teacher, literacy teacher, and learning leader, where she supports building staff capacity with high impact strategies and assessment practices. For the past seven years, she has had the opportunity to learn and work in schools where 90 to 95% of, of the student population are learning English as an additional language. It was here that Jennifer completely re-envisioned a K-4 schools learning commons with a focus on language acquisition and play. Jennifer's passion and curiosity around literacy practices supported by research and language acquisition led her to begin her graduate studies here at UBC. Next, we have Dave Track, who is a secondary English teacher, a former teacher librarian, and a former teacher consultant for digital literacy and ADST in Richmond. Inspired by the maker movement, Dave has been trying to incorporate design thinking principles into literacy work with his senior English classes, particularly through digital media. Next, we have our own uh, Nora Perry, who is a PhD student here in LLED, who has recently completed an MA in the same program focusing on digital literacy, video games, and gender. She has worked in curriculum development with Science Venture, a STEM not-for-profit located on Vancouver Island, holds a B.Ed. from the University of Victoria and, it, and a teacher librarian fifth year diploma from Queen's University. And then we have Richard Beaudry, who is an information specialist and librarian working and teaching in academia. Uh, he, is the, he is my partner in crime, a co-coordinator of the teacher librarianship diploma and certificate program and is an adjunct professor here at the University of British Columbia. And so now that you have a quick overview of our wonderful respondents here, what we're gonna do is get started by offering them each a little bit of time to just sort of speak about what came up for them as they were listening to our wonderful researchers present their work. Um, and after we hear from each one of them for a few minutes, we're then gonna open up the space to a little bit more of an organic conversation so we can all kind of uh, take it a little bit more discursive if we wish. So um, perhaps we should go in the same order that I introduced you. So Jennifer, would you like to take the floor and offer your first response? Thank you so much, Amber, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm coming to you today as an uninvited settler on Treaty 7 territory in uh, Calgary, Alberta. Um, I want to thank everyone for sharing your research today. What came really came forward for me was that the research that you were bringing forward um, resonates with what I have been witnessing and experiencing as an educator. Um, when I listened to Melanie talk about interstitial uh, spaces and those sort of unstructured learning spaces, that is sort of how the Learning Commons came to be a project for me in our building. 
Um, it was a very quiet library, um, but it really needed to become the hub of our community within our school. What we did was I looked at the learning that was taking place in the classrooms. Um, I looked at content or skill sets that students were working with or struggling with, and I found literature, picture books, and then created provocations to go along with that and created it and set it up within the learning commons. Sometimes it was exploring gourds with magnifying glasses. Sometimes it was art or sorting vocabulary words, but it was all around play. What ended up happening was that learning commons became a very busy, very noisy, engaging area. It became the hub of the school. But the learning that took place there has been reiterated through the research that we heard tonight. Uh, there was no script in that learning. Uh, it was creative. It was social. And in that, I witnessed the development of language, playfulness with language, as we heard earlier tonight. I witnessed uh, social skills and friendships developing. Because it was low stakes, it created space for creative risk taking. And really, as educators, we want our students to be able to become thinkers. And so when suddenly there was no right answer and the stakes were low, particularly for students who are learning an additional language, this playfulness allowed them to enter into these provocations and be creative in their problem solving and bring with them the experiences and knowledge they had from their own life to solve these provocations. Um, so I think when Melanie's talking about those those spaces, those interstitial spaces, I, it's very, very um, been effective in my experience. Um, an additional thing that I sort of realized is that um, even when we step away from the literal sense of play, thinking, uh, imagining children playing with toys, playing with a math problem and being playful with language, um, really sort of opens up so many options and multiple entry points and a multimodality for students to enter into. When I listened to um, Shelby talk about sort of the disposition of play and mindset, the disposition in the learning commons shifted. Um, I listened to Harini talk about long held belief systems being sort of pushed back against with play. And I can see that as sort of a challenge in education when we see teachers perhaps feeling like, how do I explain myself if my you know, supervisor walks in and sees my students playing or I have all of this curricula that I need to cover. And so how do I go about doing that? Um, additionally, sort of the last thing I wanted to address was that you know, Ava was talking about playful language and challenging conversations. I'm I'm now working in a very large middle school. And one of the things that I'm sort of finding that I'm doing is I'm helping students resolve conflicts in the office. When we address them in that sort of very formalized, serious uh, type of language, it, it, there's an immediate shutdown. However, when there is a bit of a playfulness, um, as well as play. So if you walk into my office, you'll see a Buddha board where they can paint with water and you'll see different toys and fidgets and brain balls that we are literally playing and speaking in a playful manner. Um, I definitely get more in those conversations, a deeper connection. I build stronger relationships, which in turn, um, that vulnerability allows us to get to know each other and for them to grow. And so I think that it's very confident building as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for those opening words, Jennifer. Uh, Dave, did you want to uh, talk about what surfaced for you? In yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so before I left for to come here this, this afternoon, I talked to a couple of my students and I said, hey, what do you want teachers to know about fun and play? And uh, they said, well, there's two things. Um, they said, well, first of all, we like activities. Activities are fun. And I kind of followed up. I was like, like, all activities, like every activity is fun. And they said, yeah, actually, like, even the like serious ones are fun. Like, it's more engaging than just sitting there and taking notes and doing tests and stuff. And as uh, we were talking and the topic of humanizing education, 
it made me think a lot about how the vessel model of education is so dehumanizing that we're just pouring information into kids' heads and that hopefully some of it will end up on the page when the test comes. Um, so yeah, I, I thought a lot about that as we were talking. And then the other thing that they sort of said is like, it's really important that their teach that teachers relate to their students. And uh, it really helps us feel like you understand us and understand where we're coming from. And I think this was in response to me just talking to them about League of Legends a few minutes earlier. Um, <laughs> but it, it it's nice. It builds that rapport. And I think that came up a number of different times along the way is, is being a human being with your students and, and letting the humanity show through. Um, and so, like, I took so many notes, but I think I'll cut myself off there. <laughs> Thanks. I was telling you how wonderful your presentations were. Uh, so I heard a lot about sort of community and safety were these underlying principles that kept coming up for me as I was hearing about play. And so where I was seeing that was a lot of, um, we first heard about that from Melanie in the interstitial and inter institutional levels of the classroom. And the idea that you could turn a whole classroom into an interstitial space when you release that power dynamic. Um, we heard it for, about uh, the sort of safety and power from Jordan, uh, from Harini's stories, and how uh, they felt safe to share in the interstitial space in the back line of the classroom. And then the minute someone turned that into an institutional space and institutionalized that interaction, uh, that safety was really lost. Um, we also heard it, um, as Shelby shared, in that safety for Juan to be successful in his teacher's class and how that one classroom went from being a really institutionalized space to going into that interstitial space. Um, and then Kevin also said, I'm going to directly quote you, uh, educators can name and shift those social contexts in important ways. Um, so it really made me reflect on what an educator's role is as a safe educator and how place-based learning is so crucial um, in terms of recognizing the community in your classroom and also recognizing the people that your job is to guide, not just facilitate, not just be sort of a, a passive facilitator. It's not that pouring model. Um, yeah, and then to look at it from sort of Ava's more focused in perspective, we also saw that this talk that the educators facilitate can be playful or serious. And looking at that in the interstitial institutionalized model was a really sort of interesting way to phrase the whole thing. So I really liked seeing these conversations in conjunction with each other and seeing how they all played together. Um, last thoughts, I think, where I was trying to come up with sort of really functional ways to be a teacher and facilitate this. And, you know, initially I was thinking bulletin boards and when you make the classroom more interstitial fundamentally, you know, you put their artwork up, you let them tell their own stories. Um, and then sort of, I've seen a lot in my own research when the whole classroom is turned into a play space and the teacher is sitting back, what does that look like? And so um, allowing for that play, even if it's guided or even if the teacher's circulating, allowing for those changes of motion, kids sitting on the floor, kids in the back of the class. You can you tell I was a, a, an early educator, not a, not a high school educator. Um, yeah, I think those are most of my thoughts. I'm sorry, it's a little jumbled. There was so much to think about and talk about here, but. No, those were beautiful connections and reflections. Thank you so much, Nora. Um, and lastly, uh, Richard, would you like to talk about what came up with you? Well, I very much appreciate everything I heard today and I thank them very much for their presentations. I think what I retained from this is, and I'm gonna take the perspective of being a teacher librarian, which I was for 30 plus years. Um, one of the things that I think that we've changed uh, a lot over the times, it's the recognition of what this research done is that we have to interact with the students in a way that's not simply educating it's to 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 work with them I, I know that when i started off as a teacher librarian it was basically uh, shush they're here to read this is what there is now we have really changed this in the last 10 years in a lot of the schools in bc and and what we do now is we're literally telling the students we hear you we know you're there and this is the world that we have here in vancouver we have students from all over the place and instead of just celebrating certain holidays, we celebrate the students and where they come from and their their genre and their, their you know who they look like and where they're from. This is something that we work very hard with in school libraries in BC. And basically the playfulness is what's important too, because we also 
in our libraries have introduced an open concept in the sense that they can come in and they can do crosswords and they can do and they can do puzzles and they can do connectics and they can do all kinds of different things in the library and i think this is the playfulness that we're looking for because it brings them in to the library and it's not just an interest of having them okay choose a book and you can but you can also do other things so the library is an open concept it's very important and and what everybody has talked about today is the fact that we have to interact with the students and not simply you know tell them this is what you need to learn but saying how can you come here and enjoy yourself? Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you so much. It just keeps getting better and better. Um, so I'm mindful of the time. We only have some precious moments left. And so I wanted to just make sure that we had a little bit of space at the nearing the end of this session to open it up to our audiences if they would wish to offer uh, a question, a comment, a compliment. Um, to our researchers and our respondent panel. Um, we have, I'm mindful that we have two audiences here. We do have one in person and we have our wonderful folks on Zoom. And so perhaps what we can do is maybe go back and forth. Um, I don't know if you want in to the chat. I don't oh. think it's, um, sorry, I haven't been paying attention to the chat. Um, no, there's nothing. No, yeah. Nothing. I didn't think so. And you're also welcome to raise your hand if you're in Zoom and just try to signal to us that you have um, yeah, Jen. Um, I wanted to pose a question to our audience and to our researchers. We, I know that students are ready to play. Um, I think we all know that they are. There isn't resistance really to that, and even if they're a little unsure, it just takes a minute or two, and they're right into it. I wonder when you enter into doing research around play, I think about some of the barriers that I have personally had to battle for my own practice, but also systematically um, and thinking about sort of the broader range of uh, education and curriculum and expectations and that efficiency that was early discussed earlier. I wondered um, as researchers, when you were working with educators, um, how did you work with perhaps that discomfort that maybe the adults felt around play uh, to sort of engage them in that play? Because as we've heard from your research, it is, it is so important that the adults are vulnerable and model that and, and playful as well. Can I start answering if that's okay? Um... So many of you know I was an ELL strategist in a school district, so I think I'm going to put that hat on for a second before I flip to a researcher's lens. Um, so when I think about teachers in play, often their discomfort is the fact that we have a curriculum that needs to be followed, right? And there are certain mandates in every, whether you're in the U.S. or you are in Canada, we have certain things that we need to be teaching our students. However, one of the big things that I have found, and more so with our upper grades, not, I hope no one's offended here when I say that, is sort of this point that, oh, I need to prepare them for the exam. Oh, I need to do this. However, what I have found with teachers is bringing in the research, bringing in mindful, like really interesting pedagogy, um, co-planning with them, um, and involving them in that conversation sometimes can flip their minds. I mean, you can only work with those that are interested to be flipped. Um, and I know some of you would also say that too as well. Um, but it is about building their capacity so that these teachers can do the work. But I, I will let someone else answer now. That would be my answer. Anyone? I, I can just add on a little bit. Um, the teacher that I worked with um, when I was sharing Juan's story, she definitely had decided to take that disposition on. She had been teaching for 15 years. And um, I think it's also worth noting she is a white cis female, right? So she has a certain amount of privilege um, based on her identities. And just, um, I think she was thought of as like a, a mentor at the school too, because of the length of her career. Um, so for me, what comes up a lot is how um, do identities of teachers shape possibilities for play again, back to kind of like how are social contexts allowing or limiting what's possible with play. I'm working with um, pre-service teachers right now and how I've kind of um, been exploring this tension that you bring up, Jennifer, is to think about how um, certain 
skill can be layered with play. So I've been um, talking about like playful invitations to writing, for example. And I think this kind of adds on to what Melanie was bringing up about. We have a curriculum we're required to teach, but how can we layer on playfulness to show that, you know, for me, I think about rigor and play as accomplices. They're not in opposition of each other. So I think that's one way that I'm kind of exploring that tension and thinking about it. I'll share some thoughts um, if I can. Um, yeah, Jen, if, Jennifer, a few times you mentioned low stakes, like how playfulness can can offer kind of a low stakes for students and in uh, kind of environment for students. And you noted how powerful just that kind of environment can be. And um, I'm thinking also about um, when Kevin was talking about listening with our hearts and how can we listen with our hearts and then tying to my presentation about kind of this awkwardness that can come up in these micro moments or these small moments in interaction that, you know, there's so many moments in a day, infinite moments, infinite interactions. Um, but so often we're not even aware that we're like, oh, this is uncomfortable or this is awkward. Let's change the subject. I mean, I did it a lot in the research actually, because I'm a human. Um, but I wonder if, uh, you know, it is, it's, the perennial challenge of what to do about the system and, you know, these larger expectations and what if, you know, my principal comes in and sees us playing and they, they're they not into that and they don't understand that pedagogy. I'm just thinking that um, it can be very powerful, as you noted, to, to find ways to cultivate kind of low stakes moments in the day, you know, um, and that can include just in an interaction with, with students, conjuring the sense of listening with your heart, which can mean stepping back and letting it kind of happen just letting it be a bit uncomfortable for a bit and like in in my data um i i didn't i didn't say anything for a moment but then one of the other children stepped in and 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 ran with it which actually was more powerful i think in a way than it would have been if i'd said something considering power dynamics and things so i don't know i yeah i don't know how to respond to um kind of the larger questions but i think there is something to be said for what can educators do in a moment by moment kind of way that we do have control over. And so in interactions with students or in, in watching students engaging in interactions, um, obviously if it takes a turn and suddenly becomes unsafe and there's, you know, language that's hurtful or harmful, then we certainly do need to step in, but it's, it is, um, can be, I think useful to take a, just take a beat, you know, and, and let it be uncomfortable for a bit and see where it goes. Jennifer, thank you for that question. Um, I'm also going to follow along with my colleagues and offer a perspective from, from a multimodal literacy space and thinking about how we think about um, what playfulness offers and what multimodality offers and thinking about going back to the relationality, thinking about what Kevin and Eva just said about the heart, um, but also thinking about um, sort of the freedom that non-normative ways of thinking about assessment, thinking about design, thinking about classrooms, expectations. And so if we are thinking about creativity, if we are thinking about risk-taking, curiosity, if we're thinking about ways of meaning-making that are not print, ways of meaning-making that are not um, English dominant, ways of meaning-making that are um, generative and inclusive of everyone, perhaps then that offers us an avenue to be playful in our um, practice and also be brave in our practice um, and be heartful in our practice because then that op opens up all of those domains. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reaching for that really relational, very multimodally um, and culturally sustaining um, way of thinking about the heart, thinking about art, thinking about all of those spaces as safer spaces. And, and not to, um, again, hierarchize play as being less than or more than, but just as much as and just as powerful as. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but that, that's where my mind's going. Thank you. There's an audience member here that would like to say a few words. So I'll let Esther Stewart talk 
Wait, well, you, Jennifer, you did invite audience members, so I figured I would uh, give my two cents. Can everybody see me online? Yes. I'm kind of you could have come over. In. <laughs> yeah, you're no, no, I'm good. I'm just an audience member. I'm not a panelist. Um, Carrie Ewart is my name. I'm the Master of Educational Technology Program faculty and um, coordinator for equity, diversity, inclusion, decolonization, and anti-racism. However, I'm coming at it from multiple lenses. I was reminded in this question about Sir Ken Robinson and a TED talk um, that he does. And he talks about the fact that schools, there's such a disconnect between what people believe in the way that students learn best versus what you actually see in classrooms. And scoured the country and talked to hundreds of thousands of teachers and asked everybody, how do you feel about the way that students learn best? What is it that you need, those conditions for that learning to stick, to be sticky learning? And everybody says they need to play, they need to work together and collaborate. You have to give them multiple opportunities to work with real world problems, to share their narratives, their stories, their identities. But what you're seeing in classrooms is you have row upon row, you know, in the traditional ways of learning. You have teacher directed learning, you have a set curriculum, you have siloed subjects. And what we know the way that we that our students learn best versus what you see in classrooms, there's such an intense disconnect. But what I'm hearing today from everybody, it comes back to this incredible idea is that you need to give those students the chance and that option and that opportunity and affording to work together to really bring their affinities into play and ultimately to play, to bring it back to the grassroots of how do we learn best? And we go back to indigenous ways of learning, knowing and doing. And we go back to traditional and oral story retelling. And you go back to how are they learning? They're learning through doing, they're learning by that experiential aspect of it. But so, so often, and especially we, you talked about the fact that there's such a disconnect when you get to the higher grades because it's that preparation. And not to bring, you know, the whole AI and chat GPT and everything into this conversation. However, people feel now that there's, there's this new exciting wave and era where people need to start thinking about the way that we are rejigging education for our for the future and it goes it's moving away from the traditional sense of looking at writing essays and looking at the ways that we're asking our students to demonstrate their learning their strategies and so if we can bring it back to that foundation of play so that we get back to a more connective sense and not preparing students for the industrial revolution but looking at play as the basis to everything is that learning growing and doing so i just wanted to give my two cents as an audience member, I know these panelists and our responders are maybe much more knowledgeable than I, but I figure that this could be a con contribution. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and Dave is going to say something. Yeah, I'll try to be pretty quick. Um, and I'm going to, I'm, I want to use a metaphor, not just because Carrie's in the room, um, yeah, but, I but I, I think about the fir very first like frame of Super Mario. When you play Super Mario for the first time, uh, you're going to die. You're going to run into a Goomba and it's going to kill you. And that's how you learn to jump, like because you fail and you die. And then you jump and then you hit the block above and it bounces you back down and you get killed by the Goomba again. And you're failing comfortably and, and safely and it's okay. And nobody's putting pressure on you to do it right the first time. And you can always hit restart and continue as many times as you want. And you'll be right back where you started. It's okay. And that's so important that we create low stakes environments where kids feel safe taking a risk where they're okay if i don't get it right today i can try again tomorrow and i'll get better each time and next time i'll get to level two and then maybe i'll get to world two and then maybe someday i'll beat the boss and when i'm done there's super mario 3 waiting for me <laughs> to try it again and so like, I think the more we embrace that kind of play and help our colleagues sort of see the value of playful learning and playful risk-taking with lower stakes, I think it can be really, really helpful. And so I was kind of reminded of what some of the panelists talked about earlier is just the importance of school culture. I think school culture makes a huge difference. And so 
Um, I mean, it's an, it's a bit cliche, but we have to be the change we want to see. And so like being the person who's willing to, um, spare a little bit of time to run your your kids through Dungeons and Dragons after school to spare a little bit of time to open up a, a Smash Bros club after class and just creating a culture where play is in is welcome and their own lived experiences are welcome too I think is really important so I want to say thank you so much first of all to our presenters to our audience members the amazing graduate students in both the LITR and LI22 cohort teacher librarianship program students and everyone that is also part of our LLED community for coming out and joining us today I hope that you had a playful time and that I hope wherever you may be that you continue to be playful um, throughout the week and beyond thank you so much